Um, yeah, this has been a wild year. I, I published uh, not just this book about Jim Brown, but a book with a guy you might have heard of, Michael Bennett, called uh, <laughs> Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. And for this particular white person, what was really uncomfortable was putting out two books at the same time, because after a while I forgot to really t learn and remember how to talk to, what do they call uh, humans? <laughs> it, was just, it was a lot of work. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about Mikey B, Michael Bennett, about that book as well. So uh, please, and, and actually I think there's a very interesting uh, compare and contrast to be done with Jim Brown and Michael Bennett, which I hope we can also uh, discuss. So before I say anything um, about Jim Brown, uh, I want to tell a little story. Uh, some of y'all, definitely uh, Jesse over here has heard this story before, but uh, it's kind of illustrative. and. It's one I've, I think about a lot, especially in the context of this Jim Brown story. This is a story from about 12 years ago after I wrote my first book, which was called What's My Name, Fool? Sports and Resistance in the United States. And, oh, thank you, Dean. <laughs> and uh, the cover of the book is a big Muhammad Ali face. And I, I went into a bookstore in a city I don't want to name. All right, it was Philadelphia. Yeah, you've heard the story, too. And I went in there and I said, uh, hey, I'm, I'm here to do the What's My Name Fool talk. Uh, my name's Dave Zirin. And the, the very well-meaning person behind the counter, he said to me, but, but you're white. And I said, yeah, last I checked. What does that have to do with anything? And he said to me, but isn't that you on the cover of the book? <laughs> and, and it was a wild thing. This was uh, an, an, an anarchist bookstore. And I'll... Never forget looking around this bookstore and they had all this incredible literature about past struggles and, and, and all of this remarkable, I remember posters of people like uh, Emma Goldman and Malcolm X. And I remember thinking to myself, my goodness, you know, they have all this radical everything around here, but they're utterly unfamiliar with the most famous uh, war resistor in the history of war, arguably. And, and so that really then became my mission. I was like, I'm going to reintegrate the radical tradition uh, with sports. I'm going to make sure sports has its proper place in the radical tradition, because I think it does exist. Now, I've been trying to square that story, which I've told a lot over the years, with the fact that I just spent five years of my life writing this book about Jim Brown. Uh, Jim Brown, somebody who uh, endorsed Donald Trump in the last election cycle. Uh, Jim Brown, somebody who recently said that if he was running a team, there was no way he would sign Colin Kaepernick. Uh, Jim Brown, who, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Jim Brown as well, uh, who has this, of course, very long uh, history of allegations of violence against women, which is, uh, you know, so, so it's like this idea of like, why would I spend five years, you know, really investing myself in this person's life? Why would I? Uh, fly out to California where he lives in Los Angeles and, and, and sleep under his pool for four days and speak to him whenever he was dating to give me like 30 minutes or 20 minutes in the 100 degree August sun uh, it, uh, two miles up in the Hollywood Hills. Like why did I do all that? that that week? If people have questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. That was odd in and of itself. But, but it's just... Like, all of these questions, I've asked myself, why did I do it? And there's a, a, sh a short answer and a long answer. And when I say there's a short answer, one of the things that uh, book publishers sometimes tell you is they say, for any beers aspiring writers, they say, you have to be able to explain why you wrote your book and the time it takes to ride an elevator. And I hate that quote because, you know, one, I mean, I'm from New York, so I know what it's like to get caught in an elevator between the... 12th and the 14th floor, because there's no 13 and whatnot. Um, sorry, I'm a little loopy, by the way. So just take that into account as I speak about this. Um, and so it's like there, there is no short answer for why I spent five years writing this book. I could give a short answer. I could say, well, I did it because he's Jim freaking Brown. And shockingly, only one other biography of him has ever been written, even though he's arguably the greatest football player to ever live, arguably the greatest lacrosse player 
who ever lived, uh, somebody who made his mark on these incredible canvases over the last uh, 60 years, a uh, person who was at the heart of the black freedom struggle and the black power movement in the 1960s, uh, a person who was part of the black exploitation era in cinema in the 1970s, um, a person who attempted to start an all black film company uh, that was with him and Richard Pryor uh, called Indigo Pictures where it didn't last very long after they passed on two films, one called The Color Purple, the other called Purple Rain. Um, <laughs> Maybe they had something against the color purple, period, uh, lowercase. Um, and, and it also didn't last because him and Richard Pryor had a blow up for, like, for the ages uh, where they never spoke to each other again. And, and so, so, it's like, so he's had this um, incredibly interesting full life and one that's still relevant. I mean, he came on the scene 65 years ago and I'm still talking about the fact that what he thinks of Colin Kaepernick still matters. Reporters still want to know what he thinks about these things. And how many people have really been relevant across American life for 65 years? That's Jim Brown. And so that's the short answer of why I wrote this book. Uh, but the long answer is something much different. The long answer is that I've often and not often, I've always uh, been obsessed with this question of masculinity in sports. The question of masculinity in sports. Because I believe sports, and particularly football, more than anything else, constructs in our society what a lot of young boys think in terms of what it means to be a man. And what it means to be a man usually has these young boys caught in what a former player for the Baltimore Colts named Joe Ehrman calls the man box. And the man box means that you grow up in this very constricted space where it's somehow wrong to be emotional. It's somehow wrong to care about your mental wellness. It's somehow wrong uh, to be vulnerable. It's somehow wrong uh, to actually treat the women around you as if they're equal partners in your lives. And I think, all of the, I think football plays a big role in constructing the man box and therefore also constructing um, forms of sexism, patriarchal behavior and all the rest of it. And uh, Joe Ehrman, uh, he's an amazing guy. He goes around and he speaks about his experience playing for the Colts and the man box and, and he goes around and speaks about how sports can be used to actually uh, fight the man box and teach a whole different kind of, of lessons to young, to young boys when they play sports. So that's a shout out for Joe Ehrman, who I interviewed for this book at great length. And so I've, I've, I've really, I'm, I obsess about that, like this question of masculinity. But then there's a complicated question, which is what do we say about the assertion of black masculinity? Which is a different question than just the question of asserting masculinity. And I'll, I'll connect this to Jim Brown in a second, I promise. Um, but this question of black masculinity is very important because oftentimes over the last 150, 200 years, the assertion of black masculinity has been like a cudgel against racism. Because when you have a society that treats black men as if they are boys and uses that as an epithet, when you have a society that has systematically uh, destroyed the black family um, going back hundreds of years, there, there have often been times where asserting masculinity in the face of that has been uh, this incredibly inspiring and progressive act. Think about, for a second, the, the famous signs at, in 1968 at the Memphis sanitation strikes where Dr. King lost his life. People know this, people remember the slogan of that strike. It wasn't, let's win the strike. Like, what was the slogan? I am a man. So asserting this idea, I am a man. And so when you have black sanitation workers saying, I am a man, and saying that to a society that's treating them literally like, like the trash that they're paid to pick up, that's very powerful. But I'll tell you this, if, if, if my dad showed up at Thanksgiving dinner with a big sign that said, I am a man, I'd be like, ugh, somebody show him the exit, please. You know, this, this is going to lead to a very uncomfortable evening. <laughs> so, so the context of that is very important. Another example is um, when Malcolm X was assassinated, Ossie Davis gave one of the most uh, famous eulogies of the last hundred years, and I encourage you, if you've never heard Ossie Davis's eulogy, uh, to listen to the, the tape of it. And Ossie Davis, who is a, people don't know, who is an actor with one of the great voices, uh, like defines the word, it's a SAT word, stentorian voice, like super deep. And Ossie Davis, um, his, his big line in that, see, he said, Malcolm was our manhood. And so you have this assertion of, of black masculinity um, as a way to fight racism. So, 
So th that question looms large. And so this question in my head is, um, okay, so this idea of asserting masculinity in a vacuum, I mean, this is something that I would argue is very destructive. It breaks down uh, solidarity. It breaks down this question of equal rights, and it puts uh, men in a position psychologically of superiority over women, and that's very damaging, that, that something that needs to be actively fought. Sometimes it's referred to as toxic masculinity, but that, that implies that there's a good masculinity in, in, in this context. So, I mean, I think... Left, up, left to its own devices, I think it's toxic. Um, and, but black masculinity, is this something that is inherently positive or does it also contain the seeds of that broader toxicity of masculinity? And Jim Brown to me was the person who I felt like was and is this incredible vessel to look at this question uh, because and one reason is that Jim Brown has made this easy throughout 65 years of his life. You can look at his life and at every turn, whether he's playing in the NFL, whether he's um, investing himself in the defense of Muhammad Ali when Muhammad Ali refused to go to Vietnam, when he's fighting for black representation in Hollywood, but also when he's defending himself against allegations of violence against women, he's asserting his manhood. And he's saying direct quotes, like, I'm not going to be treated like anything less than a man. I mean, Jim Brown, I could tell a, a million stories about when he's done this. But one, one of the uh, most famous ones is when uh, Jim Brown decided that he was done with football. I mean, this had never been done before. And in recent years, you've had more football players who are under the age of 30 uh, walk away from the game because, as they say, I want to walk away, not limp away. As we know more about concussions, there have been a lot of early retirements. But for decades, the only person who walked away from the game and didn't limp uh, really was Jim Brown. The only star to ever do that was Jim Brown. And Jim Brown did so, he walked away from the NFL the year after winning the Most Valuable Player Award and two years after winning the NFL championship. And this is in, I believe, 1965. And why did he do so? He did so because he was in Europe filming a movie called The Dirty Dozen. And uh, the owner of the Cleveland Browns, a gentleman by the name of Art Modell, said that he was going to <laughs> fine Jim Brown $5 a day for every day that he missed a day of training camp because the film was running long. And Jim Brown's response was to actually deliver a written speech from the set of The Dirty Dozen where he said, I'm not going to be treated like anything less than a man by Art Modell. You have your manhood, I have mine. I'm going to stand up against this. And, you know, and people swooned in the face of that. But then in the 1960s, like Jim Brown had this iconic status as somebody who was part of the black freedom struggle and black power movement, but he was also somebody who was a staunch critic of Dr. Martin Luther King. He was a staunch critic of civil rights marches. He said, if I ever march, I'm going to march alone. Uh, and he was somebody who um, believed in the power of capitalism as a way to fight racism in this country. And he started these institutions called the Black Economic Unions that attempted to provide seed money for black businesses. And how did he justify this is he justified it by asserting manhood, saying manhood is when you know you have money in your pocket. Like to be a man means you can support your family. Be, be a man means how can you be the head of a household? You listen to the patriarchal language here. How can you be head of the household if you don't have that kind of money in your pocket? And so part of him asserting uh, that black power meant black capitalism also meant that in 1968 uh, he endorsed Richard Nixon to be president, this, this icon of struggle, this person who sat with Muhammad Ali and Bill Russell and young Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and, 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 and built, built a summit around supporting Muhammad Ali, he endorses Richard Nixon. And what's so interesting though, and this is what, again, like where Jim Brown is so like, like fascinating to me as a figure, is I combed through the black press in 1968 and there were a couple of other notable black celebrities who endorsed uh, Richard Nixon at that time, Sammy Davis Jr. and James Brown being two of them. And yeah, it gets a little confusing. Um, Godfather of soul, James Brown. And 
th there are these editorials in the black press, like calling James Brown a sellout, uh, you know, calling Sammy Davis Jr. an Uncle Tom. I could not find one word of criticism against Jim Brown. And it, it's, it's trying to like untangle that. Like what was it about him? What was it about his public image? What was it about what he represented to people? Like why is it he's endorsing Richard Nixon in 1968, yet, uh, yet Huey P. Newton is going to Jim Brown's house to have hours long conversations with him by his pool and just kick it? Like what was it about Jim Brown that attracted people? And you get to this question, I think it comes down to, uh, this question of black masculinity and this almost awe that people had in the face of it and not examining the political content underneath it, which is actually uh, quite, white, quite right wing when you, when you actually dig beneath the surface. And so, th so that's the Jim Brown of the 1960s. It, it's also worth noting that um, it, it can't be, like one of the reasons why they were attracted to Richard Nixon um, is because he actually gave speeches where he talked about black power as something that he supported as, and it's, it's wild to see it, but, but it was an attempt to co-opt part of the movement. And the first Black Power Conference uh, was actually held by a, a man named Nathan Wright, I believe, who was a, um, a black Republican in New Jersey. So that was the first Black Power Conference. So it was this effort to, to try to co-opt uh, what was so radical in the mind and heart of Stokely Carmichael and the Black Panthers uh, and turn it into something very different, and it's, it has to be said that Jim Brown was part of, of it turning, turning it into something very different. But the, where, where this stuff uh, really comes together for me, it, and this is to me the most important part of the book, is there's a whole long chapter in the book that was very painful to write and very difficult to suss through about the history of allegations against him of violence against women. And it, that chapter is called Toxic. and and. When you go through it, there are, there are a couple of things that are very important when talking about Jim Brown's history. The first is that the allegations start in the 1960s, public allegations and they, in the early 1960s, and they end, um, I mean, going into the mid-1990s. So we're talking like, like 35 years of different allegations of violence against women against him. And every time he's challenged about it, he, what he says is that these are false allegations meant uh, to tear down strong black men. So it's also using that as a way to insulate himself uh, from these kinds of criticisms. And what's crazy about it is, and what makes, like, it's like, is that needs to be said is that this isn't Jim Brown's problem. I can be really clear about this. This is because we live in a racist society. And so it's so incredibly contradictory and screwed up is that there's a part of what he's saying that's actually true. Like when he gets accused of these things, the media blows it up, you know, white athletes who do similar things, it's covered up, him it's not covered up. So it's like we live in this racist society, so there's a note of truth when he says, like it's because that I'm, I'm an outspoken black man that these charges are even brought against me. But that does, but, but to then use that to negate the fact that there are real women who had real experiences who I interviewed that were really violent with this gentleman, I mean to negate that, is also to practice a form of erasure um, against their experience. And so all of this needs to be taken into account. And the, the, what the, the conclusion I eventually came to is that, like, I think that the, I, these ideas of masculinity and the way they're translated into black masculinity as a form of resistance, while they can be very powerful, uh, it's also very volatile. And in the end, there's so many seeds of of pain and destruction that exist um, inside these, these modes of thought that they're not necessarily a form, a forward form of liberation. And I thought one of the greatest ways, like, I, like I, you, you know, you could spend five years working on a book of Jim Brown, you can fly out to Seattle to give a talk about it, or you can do something as simple as make a sign in Ferguson, which is what uh, these women in Ferguson did, which I thought was the, the best analysis of everything I'm talking about. <laughs> is that they, um, women in Ferguson who led the struggle after the police killing of Michael Brown, uh, they, they made signs that said, sim and, and marched across a bridge and shut down traffic, and the sign simply said, I am a woman. So they weren't throwing away what the sanitation workers in Memphis did in 1968, but they were saying it needs to include us too. 
because we're all fighting this fight. And I th that, that to me is the most important thing. But I wanna um, end and then take whatever questions folks have uh, by, by telling just a quick story of when I was interviewing Jim Brown out in Los Angeles about all of this stuff. And there, I mean, suffice it to say, there were a lot of things that he wouldn't answer. Like, I mean, he, he's, a, he's a tough guy. That's the other thing about him. Like, like, if I'm being like very honest about why weren't more people critical of him in 1968 and things like that, I mean, it's because he is a real presence that even at like age 80 will, will scare the down your leg. I mean, he's, I mean, and this is what he's, this is also sort of what he's had. Like, I used to think all the time, like, because I've interviewed and met uh, and, and spoken to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar a lot over the last 10 years. And I always think about when I talk to Kareem how difficult it must be to be Kareem because he's seven foot three. Like, you can't be Brad Pitt and put on a hat and some sunglasses and chill in the back of Elliott Bay. If you're Kareem, you're always Kareem. No matter what, you're Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you're seven foot three, there's no hiding that. And I, there's no doubt in my mind that if Kareem Abdul-Jabbar happened to be five foot 11, he would have been the happiest librarian in the history of the New York City, uh, New York City pu pu public school system and, and just loved being with books and talking and all that stuff, but being seven foot three accorded him a different kind of destiny. I thought about that a lot with Jim Brown because one of the, the crazy things is like, like when people speak about him, and I talk about this in the book, is that people, like, he's got this, in, there's no, Jim Brown's like one of the smarter, sharper people that you're gonna talk to, like he's incredibly, incredibly smart, but he's got this body that you can't help but look at, and, and it's crazy, like, like, when white sports writers would write about him, they would be comparing him to animals and be like, he, he's like some sort of wild African tiger and, or some a marvelous beast. Or, and that's how they would talk about him. But the black press as well said, so you look at him and he's Superman. You know, he's a superhero. He's out of a comic book. And, and, I, and I interviewed um, someone who was like 90, who was one of his professors at Syracuse. And I asked him about his impression of Jim Brown in class. And one of the, one of the things he just said to me without any self-consciousness was, you know, it was hard to concentrate on what he was saying or what he was thinking because he'd walk into the room and you could only just look at him. Or I asked Michael Eric Dyson what he thinks about when he thinks of Jim Brown and he said, a Greek god in African skin. I mean, six foot three, 240 pounds, 31 inch waist and people couldn't help but look at him. I interviewed this a woman who was a, a Hollywood producer in the 70s who met with Jim Brown about a movie project. And I asked her, again, without self-consciousness, I, I asked her, I said, so what was it like talking to him? And she said it was hard to concentrate because I kept thinking his jeans were going to rip open because of his thighs. I was just like, man, that's some <laughs> serious objectification there. Um, but, but just saying it. and. And now, of course, he's, you know, he's 82 years old, and I spoke to him, he was 80, and he, you know, it's like he, he has trouble uh, gripping a doorknob, and he has trouble turning his head, and yet still, he possesses this incredible aura of physical intimidation and power. Um, I write this in the book, I said, like, he walks with a cane, but you can only really call it a cane, like, if you would say, like, a car, it's like... Uh, a cane is to Jim Brown's cane as a car is to a Humvee, is the best way to describe it. Like it's a, a very particular kind of cane for a very particular kind of body. And he's built like a series of cute, now that, cause you know, he doesn't have a 30 inch waist anymore, he's 80 years old, but now he's built like a series of cubes on top of each other. And with this inc big head and impassive face. And so, I, and so it's like I'm sitting across from him in 100 degree heat and I'm saying to him like, can we talk about some of the history of violence against women? And he would just look at me and go, shit. <laughs> that shit. And he would get up and walk away and I would, um, you, know, you know, I didn't have a car. I'm two miles up in the West Hollywood Hills. I would go back to my little room until, um, you know, his, uh, his, his wife or his friend would come to me and say, yeah, Jim's ready to talk again. And so then I would come up and have to try something else and just try to get him to talk and get him on tape. 
And, but the one thing I wanted to ask him is, uh, what makes a man? That was the one question I wanted to ask him. What is a man to you? Like, because all these years, all these decades of him talking about manhood this, manhood that, and yet he never actually said what it means to be a man. I mean, this is somebody who uh, voluntarily went to prison in the 1990s and went on a hunger strike rather than do community service after he was arrested for smashing up his wife's car because he said that the system was trying to treat him like something less than a man. And when you said, well, what's the system? He immediately went to uh, female judges and, and the, oh, the, the judge who, who convicted him in the case. So, but that's how furious and how twisted that principle can be about manhood. So, so I said to him, what makes a man? And he started by saying things like, like nothing too interesting, just like, well, you take care of your family, you, you, know, you, you run your house. And then he said, and you never dance. <laughs> and I think about that a lot. <laughs> you never dance, because it works a lot of different ways. When I asked him to explain, he just sort of looked at me and was like, shit. <laughs> like every time I, like he does not, suffer fools. So it was like any question he didn't want to answer. It was just like, shit. <laughs> and I would try not to pee on my leg and then go to the next question. And, and so, I asked, so I asked him like very, so said like, you don't dance. Because on one level, when he's saying you don't dance, he's absolutely, I think, talking about this idea like you don't tap dance. You don't dance for the man. You don't you know, if you're an entertainer, you don't be somebody who, who feels like you have to perform in that way. You won't be treated, you know, you can't be, you won't let yourself be treated that way. Um, like, like you're some sort of old style um, entertainer, black entertainer. So he means it that way. But I also think he means it like the Norman Mailer book, Tough Guys Don't Dance. Like this idea that, it, like, that da to dance means to be vulnerable, to dance means to show weakness almost, to dance means to, to show, God forbid, like, like joy in your body and how it moves uh, in, the, in the presence of others. And th that's something that he would not accept. He could not loosen himself up uh, to dance. The same way I feel like he couldn't loosen up his mind to actually think critically about himself and I didn't even touch on, because I'm, I'm talking without notes, like where, where this was like particularly poignant is the guys also spent decades doing this work with gangs in Los Angeles. And I have a whole chapter about that. And the work he's done with gangs, it's like it's incredibly admirable. But one of the things about it is that it's called the American program, and it helps people get out of gangs. But one of the things about it, and I write about this in the book, is that part of the program and part of getting out of gang life means you have to be accountable for the violence you've committed in your life and accountable for how you've hurt the people closest to you. And so he set up this whole program where people have to do these things while he's never done it himself. And there, there are these um, images that other people told me about of him sitting in the back of the room watching other people cry. That some of the toughest young men in South Central Los Angeles with tears running down their face speaking about how they may have hit their girlfriends or how they may have caused a harm to their community. And he's sitting there impassively, like watching other people cry and tell these stories while he himself sits outside of it. So, I mean, there, you know, Michael Eric Dyson called him a Greek god in African skin. I think he's a, a Greek tragedy in African skin, a Greek tragedy that was written by the white supremacy and racism that is so endemic and baked into the cake of these United States. So thank you very much. That's a And I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions. <laughs> Any old questions, I'll, I'll just go around the room. Yes, Mr. Dean. So why did you defend Muhammad Ali in the black shadow? You know, he's been, he was asked that. I, I could give his answer to that question, but it's so utterly unconvincing <laughs> that I almost don't want to do it. Like, like he, he said, oh, no, what we, what we did back then was we planned and we strategized and we knew uh, the, the politics of what we were talking about. 
But these guys today, you know, they're just disrespecting the anthem. It's not going to get them anywhere. And he's actually done something very harmful, which is like he, he propagates this idea that they're protesting the anthem when they're not protesting the anthem. These aren't anthem protests. These are protests against police violence and racial inequity staged during the anthem and using that space. But, but he, he's big on, on talking about it as if it's an anthem protest. And so what, what, it, comes, what it comes out as is, is just this basic line that sounds like an older generation saying the younger generation doesn't know anything. So that's, which is I think all too familiar, um, not just with Jim Brown, but it's something you've, you've like often it's like its own toxicity on the left in this country, this idea oh, that young people don't know what they're doing. Um, but the, the reality of the situation is that he came out, um, Jim Brown was part of a boxing promotion called Main Bout Promotions with Bob Arum. And uh, Bob Arum called Muhammad Ali, when Muhammad Ali had his title stripped away in 1967, he called Ali a dead piece of merchandise. And uh, Jim Brown wanted to try to get Ali back into boxing because, and, and for Jim Brown, it wasn't like he was, he didn't ever thought he was exploiting Muhammad Ali, I mean, or anything like that, or that he was only standing with Ali so he could make money off Ali. For Jim Brown, this was all part of the same thing. Like, it's part of fighting racism is that you build up your business and you make money. And he saw Muhammad Ali as someone who could still potentially be a very lucrative part of the boxing world. And... So it, what Jim Brown did, and this is so people know about the Ali Summit, I'm sure the famous picture of Ali sitting with Bill Russell and young Lou Alcindor, soon to be Kareem, and Jim Brown, and then behind them a whole host of football players. The, the thing is, is that they brought Ali out there for that summit to talk about how, why they defended his decision to uh, resist the war in Vietnam and, and not um, go in the draft. But, but the, the, the crazy thing is, is that the original reason for bringing him out there was to try to get him back into boxing and convince the other football players who were there to invest in Ali so they could rebuild the promotion around him and get him back into the sport. And this is where you get to Muhammad Ali's genius because they had Ali in the back room and they wanted to, like all these football players, wanted to hear from Ali's mouth about like why he was doing what he was doing and why he was risking his capital by doing all this. And Ali, from every account, basically lectured to them for like three, four hours about Vietnam, about why he, and by the time it was done, everybody left there just glassy-eyed, like, yeah, we support Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and and, and they, they, they went with that for the Ali summit. And so this is like Ali's incredible genius at that moment. So I was going around to, I'll go all the way around, I promise. Yes, Sarah. I know. Um, that's an interesting question. I am, this is where I am with it right now. I'm not watching it, um, I'm not consuming it, but I'm following it, if that makes sense. Because I, I feel like, like if I'm, if I'm gonna like have this job where I write about the politics of sports, I mean, my God, like to not write about the NFL in this moment would be like telling the Titanic story and leaving out the iceberg. Being like, oh, it was this lovely boat ride, and Kate Winslet was there, you know, and <laughs> so it's like I need to follow it. But I used to be somebody who made sure I went to a couple of games every year and had some gear around the house and all these things like that. And that those days are dead as fried chicken, without question. I can't, in good conscience, support this league for about sixty-seven different reasons that we I think people might. Already know. Yes, ma'am. I was struck the contrast, uh, the chapter on the sort of sin wash and how empathetic and respectful he was to them compared to his treatment of white women in the next chapter. I was wondering. And the second was Bill Belichick's comment that he's yeah. one of the three best people Bill's ever met. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think Bill knows that many people, honestly. <laughs> I mean, think about that. Think about what Bill Belichick's life must be like. He probably talks to like two people. No, um, I, th I think yeah, he hasn't talked to Brady anymore. He hasn't, he hasn't talked to Brady. Yeah. 
the, the walls are closing in on Bill in New England right now. Um, no, I, you know, that connection goes back to when Bill Belichick was a coach in Cleveland and Jim Brown was connected to them there. And, and I, I don't, Bill Belichick, also a Trump supporter, putting that out there too. I don't doubt that that connection is very real. I just, uh, you know, don't put a great deal of stock into it. But it is interesting. Like I've seen Jim Brown at, at public events. People just, especially in the NFL world, they absolutely genuflect in front of him. I think, like the the first line in the book is something like, um, the in, in the, I forget it, but just that Jim Brown is the closest thing in the NFL's ever had to a warrior saint, and it, it, that's how people treat him. That's how Roger Goodell. I've seen it. Like how they treat, how other NFL owners treat him. And I think one of the reasons why they love him so much is one, just his incredible iconic status is arguably the best player to ever play. But the other reason is that he has always been anti-union and against the NFL Players Association. So there's something about that that for, for the commissioner and I mean, it's just like catnip for the, the wealthy and powerful in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, Jim Brown first in a lot of regards, uh, first athlete to use an agent. I mean, first athlete, it, it is true. Like, like when you think of what someone like LeBron James is, I mean, you could see it in some respects as an expression of what Jim Brown built in Cleveland, but the, where it shifts, of course, is in, on the question of the political content. Like you've got LeBron speaking about police violence, standing up for Kaepernick, and you've got Jim Brown taking another side to that. Um, the, 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 this is one of, the, one of the reasons why I wrote the book and why it was tough to write, um, is because you know, like communicating with some folks without naming names who, like some of those genuflectors in the sports world for Jim Brown, but some of these folks are also people who, have, who are strongly against Donald Trump and his agenda and how they, I quote a couple of them in the book, but there are, there are many others who are just absolutely dumbfounded about Jim Brown supporting Trump. And she's just like, like mind blown, upset, heartbroken, all of these different things. And so one of the things, one of the reasons why I wrote the book is to say, well, actually, you know, these elements have been in his politics for 50 years. If you know what he was saying about Dr. King, if you know uh, he was still one of the few invitees to Dr. King's funeral, actually. Um, like, to, I mean, that's one of the, the thing that's just wild things is he didn't support Dr. King. He had a personal invitation from Coretta Scott King to be there while U.S. senators stood outside the funeral, like, not able to get in. I mean, it's, yeah, it is, it, it, it is crazy. It, it's a crazy thing. Um, but it speaks to his presence and his aura in the middle of all this. But, but that's one of the reasons why I wrote it, because people really were like, how did he become this? And one of the reasons why, and this I sort of end the book to this, is it's not, it's not as simple as just also saying, well, he's somebody who's always had a conservative strain to his politics. He talked about this in the 60s. Uh, we just, maybe we just didn't pay close enough attention. It's also that he's somebody who I think lives for the fight. You know, like he, he likes being relevant and he likes sticking it to people like he um, like when uh, when Donald Trump was feuding with John Lewis uh, <laughs> Jim Brown went on CNN and he referenced uh, the march on Edmund Pettus Bridge where John Lewis almost lost his life and he said yeah like someone said well, don't you realize that John Lewis is a civil rights hero why, why do you disagree with him in his criticisms of Trump and he said yeah maybe John Lewis marched in some parades <laughs> is how he put it said watching some parades, and um, but I take offense to what he said about our president, and it's um, 
what's crazy is that 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 uh, insult of referring to the marches as parades, like that's also stuff he was saying in the late fifties and sixties. I mean, so it's always been there as part of his politics, but he also really does want the fight. Like he he does, and I don't know. There's there's this part of me, like even with everything, that's like. Wow, he really is a, a giver of no bleeps, you know, with, I mean, in, in not caring who gets offended on any, on any front. Uh, yes, and then I'll go to the back. Starting that, yeah. anyway. I know I helped him with the school. That's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I wanted to, I wanted to, um, I'm from Ohio, so mm -hmm. like, I hear people talking about, like, my grandpa loved Jim Brown. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the men in my family, like, you can never say a bad word about Jim Brown. Um, but now we have LeBron James. So, um, and then, of course, he's, he's now not in Ohio anymore, so people are stop, now with their feelings again. Mm -hmm. Wow, I mean, I want to know when your LeBron book is coming out. I mean, serious, or when your sports book is coming out. Seriously, um, the yeah, no, the LeBron. It, it's so fascinating. Um, I don't. As far as far as like, first of all, about Jim Brown. I mean, one of the things I try to argue with the book is that I, I do think that it's been rooted in a political context, but that political context has been this context of the assertion of masculinity as this all-purpose cudgel against whatever it is he's dealing with at a particular moment, and sometimes that gets very ugly, and sometimes it inspired people, depending on, on that context. Uh, LeBron, I mean, I remember us actually talking about this once, but I, I know that uh, Dave Chappelle talks to LeBron and and you schooled me about Dave Chappelle's mom and her politics, mm -hmm. which I was unaware of, because I just knew that Dave Chappelle's dad worked with a guy named Mark Nason, who wrote one of my favorite books called Communists in Harlem During the Great Depression. And um, if it, Mark Nason was also in a Chappelle show skit that people should check out sometime. What was that one called again? Yeah, I, I, Noah, Noah Black Guy, was that it? Something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The game show, yeah, and Mark Nason was like, we have a black studies professor from Fordham, and Mark Nason came. Um, yeah, what's a Lucy was one of the questions, that's right. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, but I really think that when it comes to LeBron, it, it's, it's less about who's in his ear and more about the times that we're living in, and his, his decision to step up to them. Because I remember when LeBron was, um, was a rookie, there a lot of interviews with him because he was already world famous at that time. And he said that his dreams were to be the wealthiest athlete in the history of the world and to be a global icon like Muhammad Ali. So already in his mind, and this is very different from Michael Jordan, already in his, who's often compared and contrasted with LeBron James, let alone very different from someone like Tom Brady, already in his mind he's thinking of Muhammad Ali as something to aspire towards. 
and wrestling with what does it mean to be a Muhammad Ali and be in that tradition. And of course, what it means is you have to be willing to risk something. You have to be willing to be despised uh, by white sports fans for the purposes of a bigger political project that you believe in. And what LeBron, but, but for LeBron James, I could see like over the years, like say he's a rookie in 2003, like from 2003 to 2011, those eight years, where is really the opportunity for him to do that? And then he's, but then he's playing in Miami and then Trayvon Martin is killed. And this is where it all begins, not only for Black Lives Matter, not only for this modern resistance against police violence, but that's also where it begins for LeBron James with him and Dwayne Wade getting all the members of the Miami Heat to pose with their hoodies up. And so, and I think once that started and LeBron felt kind of a different, because remember when he went to Miami, he was almost like a world wrestling entertainment villain. You know, like, like he was the bad guy. I remember people even arguing that he should like dye his beard blonde and just go out like full heel and go out there and like you know, middle fingers to the crowd and everything, like just embrace the heel role like he was in WWE or something, which would have been something for sure. But I think that at that particular moment when he felt a different kind of, of response with that hoodies, I just think that changed the game for him. And then you've seen it evolve since then with the I Can't Breathe shirts, with speaking out at different moments. And then this school, which is amazing. Uh, it's a public school. I mean, it's a shot across the bow at charter school education. It's a remarkable thing. And these right-wing commentators actually tried to criticize LeBron for the school, saying, do you realize that the school that he's supposedly paying for is getting public money? It's like, yes, it is also getting public money. It's a public school, you dumbass. You know, that's part of the frickin' point, is that it's union and supported by the public education system. But, you know, haters are going to hate, I hear. As, yeah, Jesse, and I'll get to everybody. Yeah, I, thank you for bringing that up. I swear that was also something I wanted to, I said that at the start. I was like, I'm going to talk about this, and then I didn't. And I bet, you know, Jesse, you could speak to this better than I could, it, but just, you know, being around Michael Bennett and working on this book with him. First of all, they're very, very different books. The Jim Brown book's a biography. The Michael Bennett book is Michael Bennett's voice. And so what that meant was spending time with Michael, uh, working on the book with Michael. It's written in the first person, so it, it's all Michael. And I was just the person who translated his, his words to the page and, and organized them, basically. It was more like an editorial job than, than a writing job. And the thing that, that's so striking about Michael and why it was also, I got to say, like such a tonic when I was working on this Jim Brown book is just the, everything you said, Jess. Like he has, like Michael Bennett's someone who really does believe in these basic ideas like like an injury to one is an injury to all, and injustice somewhere is a threat to justice anywhere, like these slogans that people might be familiar with. And, and so it, that extends for him very concretely into these ideas of, that he's wrestling with, of feminism, of women's liberation, about what it's going to mean for his own family to embrace these ideas, about the kind of world he wants for his daughters. And he's gone uh, fully political and with with these sets of ideas. And now he's wearing hats in Philadelphia that says immigrants make America great, like with a red hat and the white lettering for all the people to take pictures of. And that's, that, that, that's I mean, the, the word that keeps coming to mind is just like, is humanism, you know? Like he has this very broad-based idea of and, of, and he talks about that a lot too, about like fighting for 
the human family, and, and that, but that means standing up against injustice. And uh, that's, but the, but the bigger thing was like the contrast of interviewing Jim Brown and having him be like such a sort of granite mask, and then speaking with Michael, and Michael like being willing to just like cry as he spoke about his mom, and just being like total, like the difference between somebody who has to give off this impression of invulnerability, and then somebody who's willing to be just totally vulnerable totally vulnerable and I think like that's and that so here we have this football player this three-time pro bowler who has destroyed the man box that football creates consciously because I don't think you can destroy it like unconsciously I think it exists independent and he's somebody who has like torn the walls down of that man box to be a very different kind of person and I saw it when I visited the Seattle facilities too like how he interacts with other players, like where it's like this super macho environment, like like meetings with the other defensive linemen, and everybody's trying to, you know, g g you know, like 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 just bust each other's beans constantly, and and and, and Michael Bennett will be like, hey, how many of you even know who John Carlos is? <laughs> and one of them looks at him and says says to him something like, only you know that stupid shit, Michael. Why should I care who John Carlos is? And he's like, you should care. <laughs> 1968, do you even know what 1968 is? Do you know what that means? You know, and he's like all these things that are so taboo. He's like, I'm coming back here with books and you're all gonna read these books. And it's just, it's just like totally off the map from what these discussions um, usually are, are, are like. And, and that he does it like so fearlessly. I mean, that was a lesson to me because I think we all sometimes adapt to our environment like I talked before about what if my father came to Thanksgiving with an I am a man sign. Like, I'd like to think I'd be like, what the hell are you doing? But I might just be like, good sign, Dad. <laughs> Let's just eat some turkey and not talk about anything other than the weather. But Michael just absolutely fearless about breaking that box and doing so not just in easy environments, which is what makes him different and really unique. And then... Yes, sir, and then I'll go back. I had a question about, well, you know, Michael Bennett is, has the issues with child abuse that you're describing a lot of this, mm -hmm. that too, and I just wondered if you had some thoughts about how sports writers deal with this publicity, especially in this day and age. Have you been noticing your coverage of this has changed? It's, it's getting better because it used to be so terrible. <laughs> I mean, so uniformly terrible. I mean... There was a time where I would say if you took a typical sports writer, put it to, put this took this sports writer's usually oh, almost absolutely a white male sports writer, like like ninety nine percent as recently as like a decade and a half ago, and you, you but it's not just that they were white men; it's that they were so incurious and contemptuous of the people they were there to cover, and so you know if you took their curiosity and you put it in the inside a hummingbird, bam, bird fly backwards. You know, just like no interest in what in these players' lives or what they're going through. And you've seen it change as the sports writing landscape has become modestly more diverse in, in recent years. And through like the undefeated at ESPN and through um, the athletic has done some good hiring as well, although not nearly as good when it comes to women's sports. But the, the, these are... Um, you, you see the difference so clearly when you have a more diverse workforce that's actually from the communities where some of these players are from as well. Now that doesn't mean it's as simple as, di as diversity because it, it also, I think, requires politics and it requires the desire to not just chase the next headline because the thing that drives players really crazy is this idea that all you're trying to get them to do is to say something that can then become copy. And there's no desire to actually listen or build relationships. And that builds all kinds of walls. Yes, sir. Oh, and then. Trump is coming. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you find that there's a growing trend or a trend that you don't know about about the fact that people do athletes, black athletes, do have some intellectual issues and they tolerate it. Is there something public 
definitely. Definitely and without question. And I think it existed even before Trump or Trump, uh, Trump. Um, but before he uh, has sort of imposed this right wing white nationalist uh, fever against NFL players for the purposes of demonization, distraction, and ginning up his base, whatever the reasons are that we could talk about. Um, I think that you know that certainly has raised the stakes for players to actually know what they're talking about and to learn that history. But there's always been this world in sports where players would go to, um, and this is way before Donald Trump, when Donald Trump was still like a cheesy reality TV show host, because this is stuff I saw with my own eyes. You would have union meetings and they would bring in political speakers to speak to the players. They would bring in college professors to speak to the players. They would do panels um, about, about everything that you can imagine under the sun. And remember, like, for these players, I mean, as distorted as the NCAA system is, these are also players who have at least, uh, many of whom have experienced higher education. And uh, those curiosities don't necessarily go away. I mean, it can become more difficult if you're suffering from, from concussions and whatnot to do that. But, but it's always been there. And, um, and it's something that is one of the untold stories in what we've seen in recent years. I mean, when you have a player like Kenny Stills of the Dolphins who wears a T-shirt that says, like, it doesn't just say, like, I'm against. He's wearing this amazing shirt. I mean, I got it on my phone. That's how much I like this shirt. And, like, I've got a picture. Like, he's wearing this great shirt. It says, I don't have time for hate, racism, misogyny, ableism, homophobia, Islamophobia, bigotry, transphobia. This is Kenny Stills, wide receiver for the Miami Dolphins. So he's, and, and he's posing like this with the, with the picture. It seems. And, and you know, other players, and, you know, th th there's, and I think that is cool because what that is is it's coming out of the closet, the intellectual curiosities players. Like they're wearing shirts. They're, they're doing, they're, 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 um, they're letting people see that side of them. Yeah, I see a new generation coming up right now, people 15, even 20 years younger than I am who are using the fact that, you know, you've got the internet and this real thirst for content uh, and the fact that there have been all these uh, political happenings in sports, not just in the United States but internationally over the last several years, that all of this is coming together where you've got a lot more people. And I hear from folks a lot, like I, I heard today from a, writer at the, um, the Intercept, if people know what The Intercept is. Um, it's a website that deals primarily like, with like national security issue, like, and, and issues of war and empire. And she's like, yeah, I'm, trans I'm uh, transferring um, to being a sports writer now. And, and so it's like, what, what advice do you have? And I was like, okay. Um, 
and and so I, I think that th this is this is going to grow, but it's going to depend a lot on I think the activism of athletes because that's what's going to create the market for it. And but as long as you have this conflict in sports and this politicization of sports, you're going to have because I think it's so much has changed even in the last five years. I don't see those trends changing. Like five years ago, like you could get away with saying "shut up and dribble." Or she, you can't even get away with that anymore. Like Laura Ingram and Fox, the the um, you know, the the clan lady on Fox News, um, she she tells LeBron James to shut up and dribble. Not only does she receive such a backlash that it actually puts her on the defensive, but LeBron James is starting a documentary series that's called "Shut Up and Dribble" about political athletes. So it's like turning it around with two middle fingers way up. And, and this is, um, that's the terrain we're on right now. And, and that's, that's different. You can't get away with that anymore. Yeah, that's a great question. I didn't speak to his, like Jim Brown had um, uh, how many, ch I believe three children with his first wife that were all born in the 1960s and he was absolutely, he was an absent father. So, and, and he's written about that in his own autobiographies as being like his great regret, but a huge gap between his own rhetoric about part of what makes a man is raising your kids and him just not being there for his kids at all. And if you see uh, Spike Lee's documentary about Jim Brown, which is not great. It's called uh, Jim Brown All-American, but Spike does talk uh, to Jim Brown's kids, and they talk about him just not being there, period. Today, Jim Brown is 83, and he has two teenage children um, and that he lives with. His wife, uh, Monique, I believe she is um, in her early 40s, and, um, and it was interesting to see him interact with his children because he's, he's present. He's definitely present, but they're also like really active, like they play sports, they play tennis, they do this, they do that, they're doing all the, and, and, and he just sort of, he sort of just sits there. You know, he's Jim Brown, he's in his 80s. I mean, what are you gonna do, teenage kids? It's, it's like that line from when Harry met Sally, where Sally says Charlie Chaplin uh, had kids when he was 77, and Harry said, yeah, but he was uh, too old to pick them up. <laughs> and so it's a little tough. The kids? Only like n nothing that I could or would use for the book, but yeah, I did. I did talk to them, and they were really delightful. They were great kids. And yes, sir. And then over here. So it's great to see you in person. Um, oh, thanks. I appreciate uh, your work. Thank you for being here. Um, my question revolves around the player protests in the NFL, and you made a point. You made a whole point about um, the disservice. Made to the players when he said that they were protesting the anthem, mm -hmm. and how that sort of we see that in the playing all the time of sort of putting a uh, a wrench into the gears. And I wonder, I've been trying to figure out how to formulate this into a question. Mm -hmm. and just your thoughts would be interesting to hear. I wonder <laughs> if it does if it doesn't also do a great disservice when the response to that is well, no, 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 we're not protesting. Mm -hmm. As if to say, we're only going to go so far. Mm -hmm. But the anthem is, in this case, a political You say, no, no, we're not mm -hmm. that. Um, because that directly contradicts, I think, what we all know, which is, as you said earlier, that this country is rooted in the idea of white supremacy at its core. The anthem's part of that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm waiting for the day. I've been frustrated. One, it's not easy. I love Michael Bennett's book, and he talks about it at great length there. But I'm waiting for the day where a player stands up and says, not only does he say, "Poor people," but he says, "Poor Kaepernick," when they say, "And if we were protesting the anthem, what would be the problem with that?" Because everybody has a right to protest.
protest a song. Mm -hmm. like, you, know, you know what I'm saying? So what? Absolutely. Kaepernick was going there. I mean, he was going there. Like, Kaepernick was tweeting stuff about, like, the, the verse in the anthem that we never sing, which is totally racist. And, and I've, I've wrestled with the same thing. And I'll tell you where, where I've come down on it. Because I think the anthem deserves to be protested. I mean, and it's, it's an absurdity that it's played before every sporting event. It's naked nationalism. Its roots are in war, uh, supporting the troops in World War II. And then they just kept it after that because of the Cold War. So it's just like it became representative of this permanent state of war. And then the Cold War ends and you've got Whitney Houston singing it at the start of the Gulf War with the war planes overhead. So, I mean, so it becomes fixated as not just nationalism, but a very particular warlike kind of nationalism, um, you might say. What did Frank say yesterday? What did he say yesterday? Yeah. I don't know. What did he say? Oh yeah, that's right. No, Kareem. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't I, yeah, no, no. Just I, I didn't know he said it yesterday. I've heard him say that before. But Kareem has been very public about the racism in the national anthem. But but Colin was was really going there, um, and, and and it was heading in that um, in that direction. The where, where I've come down on it though is like I can't impose the consciousness on these players that I'd like to see, and. They have been so resolute in this argument that people who say it's an anthem protest are just doing that to try to cloud the message they're trying to express about racial inequity and police violence. That I've just sort of chosen with my own writing or tweets or whatever to support them as long as that's their argument. But I would be out there like with, with, with pom-poms and, and those little lighter things at 4th of July if somebody was like, yeah, we're protesting the anthem, we're protesting nationalism, we're protesting like why we're even playing this song in the first place. And I'll tell you this though, that's why these protests scare the powers that be so much because they're putting the protests in this particular space. And that's part of what makes it so incendiary, certainly. Mm -hmm. But whether they are aware of it or not, and absolutely that's why people don't mm -hmm. like it. Um, and what's what's really interesting about it is, uh, again, when you think of the anthem and what it means and what people are saying during the anthem at ballparks all around the country, people couldn't give a damn about it mm -hmm. most of the time. Until they see somebody who they don't think should have a voice, right, to have any sort of say, do something that they disagree with, and then it becomes... Now, my point is I would just love to see, you know, a, sort of a go big or go home mentality, if you will, if you call it that. But there's a, one of the things, and I just finished, um, I just finished Craig Hodges' book, yeah. um, which was awesome, and he had a piece in that. Um, and, and time and time again in U.S. history, we are fed, and it's a, it's a tactic, and it's a pretty effective one, that progress has to be incremental. Mm -hmm. is bad, full stop. Oh no, that's too bad. And that doesn't do enough. So anyway, that's why it's like, look, whether you think you're doing this or not, um, this is what it means. And I agree with you. I think Kaepernick was going there, and I've heard, like, you know, it's said, it's been said over and over, but the kneeling was a compromise, and people didn't really take it that. Um, so, it, yeah. I'll tell you, to, to me, one of the, yeah, also just one of the great responses where people say, Oh no! It's about respect for the anthem. It's not about the issues like um, that they're fighting over or whatever. Like, imagine if Colin Kaepernick had said, "I'm taking a knee for the troops." I mean, the owners would have been like, "Oh, taking a knee during the anthem? What could be more patriotic?" But it's because they—it's the anti-racism and the fact that the, the contrast between the anthem and racism and the collision of those two things is what takes them to that special place. Um, yes, so the, I'll take these last three and then y'all can be liberated from this.
No, I didn't do that. Um, I may. Have, I, I I was able to make him uh, smile a couple of times by you know cracking a couple of jokes as I was asking questions, but that, that's as close as it got. And um, and I and I had managed to interview somebody he played lacrosse with at Syracuse, and before the, I interviewed him, and when I dropped that guy's name, that 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 made him smile because he was like, oh my god, Roy Simmons. But uh, no, I didn't throw any shit. At you. <laughs> Sure. Thank you for that. One uh, is, uh, God, where do you begin? Um, leave, leave with this name, Rose Robinson, because uh, if, if you look at the history of athletes and whoever pro protested during the anthem, that's the first an athletic anthem protester or protester during the anthem, if you will. But Rose Robinson, 1959, um, she was a uh, long jumper. Um, one of the things that Rose Robinson believed very, in 1959 was not exactly like a high point for protest in this country. Uh, and one of the things that Rose Robinson um, believed very strongly was that the Cold War and the nuclearization of this country was uh, absolutely uh, genocidal, so she wouldn't stand during the anthem. Uh, Wyoming Atias, a person who's just was been forgotten by history, her book is coming out. Um, in October, it's called Tiger Bell. I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, and people can learn about her politics and her history. Um, and to fast forward to today with the WNBA, I mean, people should look at what Maya Moore is doing with criminal justice um, and using her platform to speak about criminal justice, injustice, and about wrongful imprisonment and mandatory minimums. She's taking all of this stuff on as arguably the most uh, famous uh, basketball player in our league, so. Oh yeah, and she was doing it before, as the WNBA players were as well, with their protests. We just had the retirement of Lindsey Whalen, uh, I believe the second all-time in assists in WNBA history, and Lindsey Whalen, white athlete, uh, stood with black players against police brutality, and this was again before Colin Kaepernick. And so this, this history is, is real, and it deserves its own book. Uh, there's the question. I was waiting for that one. Um, it's been the Great Wall of Silence since the book came out. And it's been interesting because while there has been no effort by him or any of his people to reach out to me or say anything about the book, to be perfectly honest, I've also made no effort to reach out on that end as well. I mean, largely because not, not out of any sort of apprehension or hesitation, because I'll stand by everything in the book, it's more just, you know, it's his life. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's like, and if he wants to read the book, he can read the book. If he, if he doesn't, that's his business too. And uh, I, I just, I'm fine to leave well enough alone. I, I wish he would read it. Um, I don't know if he has or not, but I think if he did that he'd, I hope that he would say, wow, I've, you know, had one hell of a journey. But thank you so much. And thanks, everybody in Seattle. I really appreciate y'all. <laughs> Love Seattle. And um, yeah. <laughs>